Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here. Joining me today is Jason Hertz, who is the farmer at Box Turtle Farm in Mount Vernon, Missouri. They raise certified organic greens year-round only in tunnels. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me. So talk to us about your farming operation, Only in Tunnels. Yes. So we, we moved to this farm. We bought this farm in 2011. Okay. And... We have 16 acres here. About six of it is tillable. The rest is just too rocky to till. And I was really geared up to do larger outdoor production. At one point I was doing two acres outside. We've got, you know, a tractor and a water wheel transplanter. But it was just weather disaster one after another. Mm. Um, I didn't realize it when we bought this farm. You can't tell from looking around, but we're actually a hundred feet higher than the surrounding area. And we're in the Ozarks, but we're in an unusual topography. It's we're on the prairie, which okay. is odd for this area. And 90% of our wind comes out of the South and the South tree line is a mile away. Wow. So on a good day, it's just breezy, but on a windy day, it's hellish. Yeah. And row cover and wind do not mix. No, no. So grow cover doesn't mix, ground cover doesn't mix. And just, I mean, wind will just shred anything we plant outside here eventually, or a hailstorm or whatever else happens in Missouri. Yeah, because Missouri is just, it's not a friendly climate. It's kind of like Oklahoma. Right. We're only about 45 minutes from the Oklahoma border. Okay, interesting. All right. So that's, that's closer than I would have thought. So where is Mount Vernon in Missouri? We are, we're in the the southwest corner. Okay. So we're about, as the crow flies, an hour north of Arkansas. Our nearest city is Springfield, which is 35 minutes away. Okay. That's where all of our marketing is done. And we're about 45 minutes from Joplin. So we're halfway between those two cities. Yeah. I've been to Joplin several times. So, all right. So what was your background before you started the farm? I was an automotive mechanic. I went to, that's what I went to college for. I have a degree in that. So I was, I was interested in organic agriculture when I was in college. I was interested in environmental activism and I was doing a lot of work with biodiesel. This was in the early 2000s before that was a thing. And it opened me up to alternative agriculture. So I, I was working automotive shops in college and I already knew that that's not what I wanted to do the rest of my life but finished school went to work I worked at a shop down the street from a microbrewery that hosted a farmer's market and I would go there and buy my groceries and it was started to hang out with some of the farmers and it was the first time I realized that that was a viable career option Mm. this probably would have been around 2005 so I'd already read Elliot Coleman's books and fell in love with that idea, but I still didn't think it was really viable until I actually saw it. There weren't any good models mm-hmm. around. Were some of those farmers you met farmers in the small scale or organic niche or? They were, I wasn't really an intern or employee. I just started helping this farmer that had a couple of high tunnels and was doing figs tomatoes and peppers okay and that was so i worked there for a few really just a maybe six months Mm. and the year after that this would have been about 2007 2008 when the economy collapsed yeah the shop that i was working for the whole company went out of business there were no jobs available i was newly married my wife and i were already planning on farming one day we never knew when that would be. Yeah. But wasn't really doing anything else. So we started, I started really small with a 12 member CSA. And I did that for two years until we went out to look for more land. Mm-hmm. 
So that would have been in the St. Louis area. And then we pretty much just threw a dart at the map and ended up in Southwest Missouri. Okay. Is that how these, these farms are ch chosen? <laughs> well, my wife worked for the state. Yeah. Department of Natural Resources. So she put in for a transfer to a satellite office mm. for a, a rural office. And she got a job offer in Springfield. And we'd never been there before she went for the interview. She got the job. So we just moved. <laughs> yeah. 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 You said, we'll figure out what, what when we get there, what we're going to do. There were things we were looking for. We wanted to be close to a city that was large enough to market in. And we yeah. had looked at the farmer's markets before we actually moved here to see what was going on in this food scene and realized there was a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. in Springfield. Yeah. So then what were the early years of the farm like? I worked part-time and I farmed part-time. So I did farmer's markets very briefly, but that was not, at the time in Springfield, that really wasn't a viable way to make it living still. Mm -hmm. Farmers markets just weren't happening here. There were several, but I would have to do four to make a living at it. Yeah. And um, I took some of my extra produce into a local natural food store and started selling to them. And then immediately realized that I didn't really have to give them that. The farmers markets were so depressed that the prices I was getting wholesale were almost as good as the farmers market prices. Gotcha. So I just laser focused on that. We certified the farm organic in 2013. Yep. And we've been doing grocery stores and a few restaurants ever since then. Okay. Okay. So what, let's talk about you moving inside. So you said you were working outside doing greens and then just because of the weather you started, did you start with one tunnel or how did you get started with tunnels? Well, actually, when I was working on, very briefly on that first farm, he had a big high tunnel okay. that was minimally heated in the winter just to keep the figs going, just to keep them alive. And he was at farmer's markets in the winter selling jars of jams and salsas. And I started, I brought in a bunch of compost, put it under his fig trees and started growing greens in there. Uh -huh. And I've been doing that ever since. So. It, it had always been part of our production. And in the early years here, I did sort of everything and expanded up to, we were in the Kansas City area. I was selling to about a dozen grocery stores up there and grocery stores in Springfield. And it was just, it was too much. And it, it was obvious that the greens were what we're selling. Yeah. And we were only doing that seasonally. And each season, it would be the same story. We had, we had one tunnel. We had a high tunnel and a lot of caterpillar tunnels. Yeah. Um, I started working on those. Windflower Farm and Dan mm -hmm. Brisebois were the yep. only two sources that were, I could find that were using that type of structure. Yeah, they were the original, and, yeah, people. Yeah, so probably 2012, I started designing my own and we lost a lot of caterpillar tunnels. Yeah, but we were. I was doing, I was doing season extension from the get go. Okay. Um, but still, salad production was only seasonally, and every season when we got started back in salad production, I would have to fight tooth and nail with three or four other farmers that were all going to my same grocery stores. Mm -hmm. So I realized that to really do that, I had to do it all the time, mm. and. That meant doing it inside all the time because I plant twice a week and it rains here. So we just kept on that path. So I think in 20, we moved out of the caterpillar tunnels and don't use those anymore. We went from one high tunnel. The second high tunnel we built was a 34 by 198. Okay. In 2017, I, I finished that in the fall of 17. And I just finished two more tunnels. So now we have four that are 34 by 72 and the 34 by 198. Okay. So just more tunnels and more tunnels, all in the name of salad production. So let's talk about the size of those tunnels. You, this seems like the most recent runs are smaller. Is there a particular reason why? There is. 
it's really because of the cropping system. The big tunnel was really nice. I needed a lot of room fast, mm -hmm. but it's really, it's too big for my scale. You know, if I get, I'm doing, so I'm doing greens in there all the time. If I get flea beetles in that big tunnel, yeah, it's a, or whatever, name your problem. I still have to plant greens in the same tunnel. Yeah, it's a bear so, to get them out. Yeah, so with the smaller tunnels, I'm going to be cropping half a tunnel at a time. So each week's production is really focused on half of that tunnel. So now I can drive the tractors in there and really simplify production. If there's a problem, I can leave a tunnel empty, just wipe it out Yeah. versus dealing with the same the same thing in that big house. So I really treat it like the big house is three growing spaces and then I have the four smaller tunnels. So it's seven plots essentially. Gotcha. All right. All right. So let's talk about rotation in these tunnels. Let's talk about first your cropping mix. You're doing greens. So does that mean spinach, mesclins, uh, lettuces? I do some spinach in the winter. Okay. Just a couple beds. Mostly our salad. Our salad mix is the mixed baby greens, red Russian kale, Mizuna, Tokyo Bikina, and the one cut lettuces. Yep. And um, since most of our sales, I would, most of our sales are salad, but it's only, I would say two thirds of it is salad mix. And we're doing bunched greens and cucumbers in the tunnels in season. So no heated production. Okay. The salad mix, our spring mix, which all the, our restaurants are getting and our grocery stores is the Salanova and the Easy Leaf lettuces mixed with mustards and kales. Okay. And then we're also doing bagged arugula and we'll do a bag mix that's just lettuce and a bag mix that's basically our spring mix, but arugula instead of lettuce. Okay. And those are in five ounce retail bags. Okay, so all of your all of your crop is leaving as a five ounce retail. Except for restaurants, we'll get it in whatever they okay. need. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If it's yeah, ten or twenty pounds bulk, whatever. All right. So let's talk about the rotation for that. Um, you're certified organic, and I think the rule is you just can't plant crop on crop. Yes, the rule is a little vague on that. Okay. So we're doing we're really only planting mustards, spinach in the winter, lettuce, and cucumbers. Mm. So I will do the baby greens one after another, but I do eventually switch that to lettuce production and then switch that to zucchini or squash, or sorry, zucchini or cucumbers Okay. and spinach. Um, but really mostly it's baby greens and lettuce back and forth. Okay, so talk to me too about the um, the bed prep for that. How are you turning things under? I am using, well, now, since we have these new houses, I'll be using our four-wheel tractor and the tiller on that to clear yeah. out whole houses. Okay, um, and so are, need, your, are your ends all open so you can get that tractor in? I have eight foot op two eight-foot openings on each end. So it's okay. kind of a, there's a process to getting it in there. And if there's, if I'm just doing a bed or if there's a corner that I can't get with the big tractor, mm -hmm. we have a Mantis XP. Okay. Which is, you know, like the little cultivating Mantis, but it has mm -hmm. a four stroke engine and it's 16 inches wide. Yeah. So I like that because it only weighs 35 pounds mm. and I can just pick it up and take it with me, but yeah. it has more power than a tilter. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a problem with that bouncing around at all on you? No, not in my soil. Okay. It, it tends to sink in deeper than I would like, but okay. you know, it, yeah, you do what you could do. So, yeah. So talk to me about, um, so we talked bed prep. So then what are you seeding with? Wait, I should actually go back to bed. Well, we'll get back to that later. The bed prep, I do have a soil treatment that we've been doing. But the cedar, we're using the four the four row pinpoint cedar. Okay. I love that little tool. So you're having to do really good bed prep then. Yes. Okay. All right. And what would you consider your soil type to be? 
we have a sandy silt loam. Okay. So it's outside it compacts really easily, but inside I've added enough organic matter that it's just really fluffy all the time. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. All right. And so then, all right. So you move from your bed prep. Are you adding any like uh, soil amendments when you do every flip or is that one time a year? Well, last year I started something different. The big house since day one, even when that was in field production, we always had a lot of soil pathogens there. Yep. And last year, late winter, I was just losing 25 it got up to 50 percent of what i was planting a lot of dampening off mm. so you know i would plant i would plant greens and they would sprout 25 percent would die and lettuce transplants i was losing those like crazy just days after transplanting oh wow so i started a type of biological soil treatment and it's now pretty much my basic bed prep it's part of my basic bed prep for each crop now. Okay. To where I'm, I'm tilling in about a hundred pounds of fresh grass clippings per bed, and a little bit of nitrogen, you know, organic nitrogen if it's seed, some kind of seed meal or a feather meal. Tilling that into the soil, raking it smooth, just like I'm, you know, getting it ready to plant. Yeah. Put the drip tape down and then cover it with plastic. And that has eliminated that problem that I was having before. Interesting. All right. So let's break that down a little bit. Where are you getting the grass clippings from? I am mowing those from the farm. Okay. Because you've got all this other acreage outside. So you just mow that, bag it, stick it in the bed. Then are you just tilling in with your tiller then? Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. And that is help. Now, you're doing that before every single turn. I don't do it in the winter because the grass doesn't break down. Okay, gotcha. But the rest of the nine months out of the year, eight months out of the year, that has become our standard bed prep. Okay. And so this is a, it's sort of a mix of two different biological soil treatments. There's biosolarization and there's mm. anaerobic soil disinfestation. And I'm not really doing... I don't know if I'm really doing one or the other, but they, to me, and I'll go into these a little bit more, they seem like they both have the same mode of action. And, you know, I was getting kind of desperate because it was, the problem was getting pretty bad. Yeah. So I just thought, I'm going to try this. And the first time I did it, eight days after the treatment, the problem was 100% gone. Wow. So it, so those two treatments, anaerobic soil disinfestation, it involves tilling in organic matter into the soil, saturating the soil to where it's anaerobic, mm. covering with plastic, and that, that anaerobic condition is really detrimental to the soil pathogens. Okay. So that was something... It was sort of discovered in the mid 20th century. Holland had a really bad flood where their fields were underwater for like a year. Oh my. And when those flood when those floodwaters receded, they realized that the soil pathogens, all these problems they had before, were gone. Huh. So uh, after a few years of cultivation, the problems sprang back up and they flooded they intentionally flooded the soils and alleviated their cultural problems again. And okay. in the meantime, in Japan, farmers there were, were rotating rice with vegetables yeah. and discovering the same effect. So this, this, these systems sprang up simultaneously on opposite ends of the world. Okay, so talk to me about how do you keep the soil saturated? Do you just keep the, the water on during while you're doing this? Well, that – my soil – is so well drained it won't really saturate. Mm. So that brings in another new technique called biosolarization. Okay. Which is that's being done commercially in the Netherlands, in Japan, in Florida, and California. So it's a very similar method 
but they're they're tilling in organic matter, they're covering with clear plastic, and they're they're not saturating the soil to total saturation to where it's anaerobic. It's definitely an aerobic process. Yeah. So they're solarizing the soil for eight days and achieving the type of the type of soil sterilization that you would get from four to six weeks of solarization. Mm -hmm. So in my attempt, these require a special type of plastic that I didn't just have on hand, the type that you would use for soil fumigation. Mm -hmm. I just took a piece of old greenhouse plastic, put that on top, took it off, and then eight days later, that bed was completely clean. Wow. Now, does this, does this also help with weed control? It does. So there's, there's a certain temperature that certain weeds are either killed or they go dormant. Okay. And I don't think, I'm not really wrapping the beds in plastic. I'm not achieving super high temperatures, mm. probably 105, 110 degrees in the summer. Okay. Um, but it seems that they're going dormant. So what's really happening, the way that I say that to me, it seems these two separate methods have a similar mode of action is that as this organic matter breaks down, the byproducts of decomposition are all of these volatile organic compounds. Mm. And if you heat for every 18 degrees that you increase soil temperature, you double the biological activity. So with biosolarization, if I'm taking a 70 degree soil up to 106 degrees, I've quadrupled my biological activity. So what would normally happen over the course of a month, that decomposition happens in a week. Mm. And it's not just a heating process, it's a biological process that is just destroys the soil pathogens while leaving the good guys intact to repopulate that area. Yeah. So it's, it, I just found this, I just stumbled upon it and was just completely fascinated by this. It's not, I don't know if you'd really consider a natural process. You're using, you're definitely working with nature, but you're enhancing things to a point that yeah. you can really zap out fungi, bacteria, nematodes. And now it's just part of the standard bed, bed prep here. Okay, so you do this, put that down, then as soon as it comes in covered after eight days, you seed. And then when you seed, do you cover it back up with anything or you just keep it wet until it germinates? I just keep it wet. Okay, all right, interesting. Yeah, that's a fascinating process. And um, so let's talk about like expanding that because obviously it sounds like a very cool technique. Are you looking into getting any like SARE grants or anything to kind of like help you try to do some more tests and trials? I did actually just this week find out that a SARE grant that I wrote for this was just approved. Awesome. So the two newest tunnels that I've built, um, they have not been treated yet. They're side by side. So one will be treated with, there'll be six beds per each. Each bed treated with a different amount of grass clippings. One will be covered in just old greenhouse poly and the other will be covered with the fumigation plastic that I mentioned, that's totally impermeable film plastic, okay. PIF. And um, we'll, so I haven't been able to knock out sclerotinia with it yet. Yeah, that's a nasty disease. It is. I, I think that I can do it with higher temperatures, mm. but what I was doing last year, I was just laying a loose piece of plastic on the ground. I wasn't burying edges or anything. Um, but now we'll have a more controlled study. Yeah. And I'd like to see if I could kill chickweed and henbit too, because yeah, we definitely still have those. Yeah. Um, so I definitely know that um, chickweed will go down with um, a full greenhouse solarization. Yeah. There's I, a lot of research that says that, that that works. Yeah, and that was in Burlington area that I saw that work at um, Krista and Mark's farm, uh, Jericho Settler's farm. So if it works that far north, it would definitely work where you are in probably a much shorter period of time, time frame. 
our treatment, the treatment in my study will only be for 10 days. Okay. But that's going to be a, that's going to be proper biosolarization. Yeah. yeah. And I think it would be really great if we could knock these things out in 10 days versus taking a tunnel out of production for four to six weeks. Yeah. That's a um, lot of, a lot of, a lot of time. Yeah. It's in the summer here. That's two crop cycles for baby greens. Yeah. So how many square feet then do you actually have now under cover? I'm just trying to calculate that. I just, the two tunnels I'm finishing up right now put us at, at about 17,000 square feet. Okay. So, so, yep. So less than a half acre still. Yeah. And last year, last year I had 12,000 12, square feet. We have actually built three high tunnels in the past six months. Okay. And August 26th, we lost a tunnel in a microburst. We, we lost a tunnel and we had a baby in the same day. Oh, that's always fun. <laughs> it actually, it's the best day to lose a high tunnel. Because you're not Cause focused you just, on that. <laughs> you don't care at all. It's, it's real. I wish I could, I hope I can bottle that and use it later <laughs> when we have disasters because there's, there's no emotion towards the loss of the high tunnel whatsoever. Yeah. It's just, okay, well, we have insurance. I guess we'll yeah. go on. So a microburst is where it just gets uh, just a, a, a really, really, really heavy duty thunderstorm all at once? It is, it's, I wasn't home. So I'm not exactly sure what happened, but we actually, we had, we had scheduled to have my wife induced, have labor induced on a Wednesday. Okay. And she had a doctor appointment on Tuesday afternoon and I went with her. And I'm watching this storm on the radar because we're getting alerts on our phone. And I'm like, oh, that, that storm is a good five miles away. Yeah. We're, we're clear. And my parents were staying with us to help out when the baby came. Yeah. And the doctor is in the room with us. And she says, well, you know, an induction, it's not a C-section. It's, yeah. it's different. But we had this scheduled the next day. And she says, you want me to see if, if there's a room in labor and delivery available? You guys can have a, you can have a baby tonight. Yeah. And we're like, uh, yeah, sure, I guess. <laughs> go go find out. So she she leaves the room. My dad texts me a picture of this crushed high tunnel. And then the doctor walks back in literally seconds later and says, You're having a baby. <laughs> and we went to labor and delivery. But it yeah. was so the actual storm didn't hit us. Our property is six hundred feet wide, and just some crazy storm came through and just crushed it like a tin can. And it really only affected the 600 foot width of our property. There were limbs down. We had limbs from the neighbor's property 200 feet away that were up against the front walls of our high tunnels. And one tunnel, it was a, uh, it was a farm tech tunnel, which those don't well, have. Of course. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not built like my others. It just, it didn't, pull it out of the ground but it inverted the hoops yeah just, just smashed like, it yeah like a boulder just fell out of the sky mm. so um we already had two tunnels that were scheduled to be built that winter and we got to replace that one too so yeah we built yeah three in six months okay so now, we'll, now we're at seventeen thousand square feet formerly twelve thousand okay so all right so you put up a bunch of new houses what tip would you give for someone putting up their first tunnel I like to do dirt work so that I don't have water infiltration into the tunnels. Uh -huh. I see a lot of farmers, especially around here, that are putting them on slopes. Yeah. But, you know, if you, have, if you have water that's running off of your tunnel and rushing in, it's worse. You're in a worse situation than if you had no tunnel. Yeah. Because now you have hundreds or thousands of gallons flooding yeah. your tunnel. Yeah. Um, so I always do a lot of dirt work so that those are on a little bit of a pad. Yep. And we're building ours with all steel. Okay. So you're pitching away on the sides. Are you doing any French drains? No, we have a pretty gentle slope to the south and all okay. of our tunnels run north and south. Okay. We've got about a, a two degree, one to two degree slope. So I just kind of bank, move, move a little bit of dirt just so I have a little bit of pad for it to sit on. 
and then it all just runs to the south. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Um, So then you build all steel. You put the big doors at the ends. How how tall are your sidewalls? I only go with a five-foot sidewall. Okay. And that's really just the first one that 34 by 198. That's sort of the standard sidewall that Morgan County Seed sells. Okay. And I was really hesitant to go higher because it's so windy here. Yeah. And it's it's high enough that I can drive a, drive my tractor in there. Uh, you know, the it still has the rollover protection. It doesn't hit the trusses. Yeah. But it's the sidewalls are not very high. Okay. So, I, okay. I think I have a stronger tunnel. And I, I work mostly alone, so I can cover those by myself at that height. I can stretch the plastic by myself. Yeah. So talk to me about where you're sourcing these tunnels from. You mentioned um, Morgan County Seeds. Is that where your, your frames are coming from? Yes, they're in central Missouri. Yeah, so they're just super close. They have a really, it's a really heavy duty frame too. And I really think that it's a, it's a pretty, it's a good value because they're, I think they're the same price as that old farm tech tunnel that I had. Mm. And the, the diameter of the steel is easily twice. Yeah. Is that on a six foot spacing? Yes. Okay. So six foot spacing. All right. So you talked about stretching the plastic by yourself. How do you go ahead, start putting that on? Do you pull it over the side? Do you stretch it down the, the peak? I roll it down the side on the ground. Yep. Okay. And I'll put C channel on the edge. Yep. Poke a hole in that, tie a rope around that C channel and throw something over the tunnel. And then I just, I do anchor it on that, say I'm on the east side. Yep. Throwing it over to the west side. I will anchor it on the hip boards on that east side so that when I pull it over, it can't fall fall back over to the other side. Mm-hmm. But I've definitely had that happen. You're pulling to the west, and it looks good. You get a little gust, and then the whole thing is on the west side. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and yeah, I just start on that that long side down the hip board, and just go back and forth side to side until gotcha. it's stretched. And then are you doing one layer or two of plastic? I am doing one. Okay. Yeah. I had have... I have had tunnels that I double covered, and I really could see the light difference in there. And mm-hmm. I'm not heating. Yeah. So I now I'm just doing single layer on everything. Okay. And yeah, so we used to do the tennis ball trick where we put a tennis ball and then tie a rope around the base of the tennis ball through the plastic. And so we didn't have to poke a hole. But yeah, that that C channel works good too. Yeah, and it's not very expensive to, you know, waste a couple of pieces of C channel. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us about um so you put up the tunnel. How many crop turns do you plan on getting in each tunnel per year? Um, I will do about – now, I'm, with the baby greens and the lettuce, back and forth, I'll do about seven or eight. Okay. Um, this is going to be a little different this year because I have more space. One tunnel, I'll just have bunch greens in, and it'll stay in that for the entire year. Uh, but the – the baby greens here in the winter, or sorry, the baby greens in the summer here, I'm seed to harvest in 15 days. And then I do my biosolarization treatment and eight days later, I'm planting it again. So it's a really, really fast cycle in the summer. Yeah, that is fast. That's less than a month. That's basically every 30 days or less than 30 days, you're turning over crops. Every, 20, every 23 days, there's a new crop germinating in that bed wow if it's just baby greens yeah so talk to me about since you started using this organic matter and the biosolarization and all have you felt that your your ground or soil quality the tilt has increased definitely okay yeah when i said that that little mantis tiller sinks in too far yeah that's actually just since i started doing this before i could i could pretty easily treat that machine like a tilter and just do the top inch yeah and now when i said that machine in there and get it going it just wants to go down deeper and deeper yeah and it's i mean you're i'm putting this organic matter in in every crop cycle so it just gets better each time i do it there's no 
there's no compaction from rain and everything else in these tunnels. It's yeah, it's yeah. great. So have you looked at a latest soil test and what's the soil test showing? I, my nutrient is pretty good. I haven't seen any huge boosts that show up on the organic, on the organic matter yet. Okay. And you know, these beds already had a fair amount of peat moss and compost and other organic amendments added to them. So I'm really not adding that much dry matter in each cropping cycle. Uh -huh. 100 pounds of 100 pounds of wet grass clippings is probably if you're familiar with hay what is that like 15 or 20 pounds of actual yeah, dry matter not that it's really, much but there's a lot of biological activity that goes on there exactly i mean it's all that rotting but then all the surface of that is going to have just massive amounts of biologicals on it well even if, you know if you if you mow grass and leave it in a bagger or if you make a hay bale and put it up wet that gets hot. A wet hay bale can catch fire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And grass clippings in a pile get hot after like an hour. Mm -hmm. So, and really with these soil treatments, you're really just trying to add sugar. Mm. Some of the some of the university studies, and actually I think in in some of the commercial applications, they're literally just adding molasses. Interesting. So, is that you're, part of your SARE study? They just do a lot molasses. No, because I'm certified organic, so I would have to have organic molasses. Okay. I yeah. believe sugarcane is GMO mostly, mm. and we can't have any genetically modified amendments either. Yeah, yeah. But I've yeah. got all kinds – and, you know, you don't really want to go too far out in a SARE study. Yeah. If you, make those, if you make those SARE studies too complicated, then it kind of outgrows itself. You. It might look good on paper, but then once you're actually implementing this, you're like, why did I add so many variables into this test? <laughs> yes, yes. I would easily get that because I just love to test everything and its brother. <laughs> yeah, I, and this isn't my first SARE project either. It's not my, and we're actually, we're doing another grant study here right now too. And I know that it doesn't, it, it's always more work than it feels like from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So what's the other study you're working on? I'm working with a group through Lincoln University. We're testing um, essential oils as an, a pest deterrent. Interesting. So we're, we're testing it to see if it will deter aphids, thrips, deter or kill aphids, thrips, and flea beetles. So it's a little too early to tell. I had some positive results and then... I had a lot of, then I had some aphid problems. So it's, it's early still. We've only been doing it since November. It's a two year study. Okay. Interesting. Well, I can't wait to find out how the, how it turns out. Yeah, we're, we're fogging those in there, but we're, we're able to change the amounts that we can use. So we started with 10 gallons, 10, 10 drips of essential oils per gallon. Okay. And I am increasing that to see if, do I need more of that? Is this enough? But just a few months in one tunnel, it's, it's really too early to tell. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about how you're, how you're fogging that in. Um, we just have, we each have backpack foggers. So okay. it's a, it's a two stroke engine. Like um, the steel 450 or? It's like that. It's a Tomahawk brand. Okay. Yeah. So it's yep. basically like a leaf blower with a tank of fluid on your back and it gravity feeds into the tip of the blower. Yeah. If anyone's not familiar with those and it blows out 200 mile per hour air, just like a leaf blower. Yeah. And we'll put the, we'll put a link to one in the show notes. So you can just go to thrivingfarmerpodcast.com and they will get all the show notes there. So um, they can grab that. Um, let's talk about your harvest now. So we've got the crop grown. Um, uh, it's 15 days old and you're harvesting. How are you harvesting those? Lettuces I harvest with knives and the baby greens is with scissors. Interesting. So I'm, yeah, I'm doing it all by hand. Um, I do have a quick cut greens harvester, but I don't love it. I think I just get higher quality with a hand cut. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm considering getting one of the walk behind models. Yep. Yep. And I know that there's new models coming to the market, but I want to physically see one and touch it before I get that here. 
Yeah, yeah. So you're looking at like the the. I was actually thinking, you know, in a year last year, I was thinking, you know, in a in a year or two, we should really get up to the scale to where a har an automatic harvest star makes sense. Mm. Um, just because of the wear and tear on my body, it's not so much my hands. I can cut greens really quickly. I've been doing this a while now. Yeah. But just being bent over, I would love to not have to crouch down to harvest. And Johnny's is coming out with a new TerraTech harvester. Yeah. It'll be run by a drill. Yep. Yep. And I just saw that and last year when I was up there. Andre Cantelmo. Yep. He's got the, name? Yeah. He's got the bigger one. So Johnny's has the little 30 inch and then Andre does everything else. Yeah. And I've talked to, I've talked to both Johnny's and Andre and Andre thinks it's possible to move the, the front wheels behind the cutter. Yeah. But that was kind of the deal breaker for me was I'm not working a 30 inch bed and I don't plan on going back to a 30 inch bed. Okay. Yeah. And I think a harvest star, the front wheels are behind the cutter bar. So you could plant a house without any walking rows, I believe, and just cut. Yeah, you'd probably have to adjust on either basically to make sure the product flowed. So because when those where those band saws to the corners of the band saws are or the corners of the, the cutter bar in the front there, I see a lot of things get trampled and stuff there. Um, but I okay, think that I makes think, sense. I think you're right. You probably if you made some adjustments there on those front corners, um, some shields and some guides, I think you could get at least 99% of the way there. Yeah, my bed tops are 52 inches wide. And I I do that because I can fit the most beds in that 34 foot house. Yeah. I can fit six beds with a 12 inch walking path in there. Okay. So your uh, hand so you till and then you basically hand uh basically form those beds. I don't really form a bed. Uh, since I'm tilling, I don't have any any problem with when I'm harvesting, I'll walk on the bed. I don't care. Okay. Um, so I do have sort of a permanent path in there that's just trodden down, but I'm yeah. not using raised beds. Okay. okay. I just don't feel that it's, I did start with raised beds and eventually they settled down and became flat ground. And I haven't really seen a difference. Mm -hmm. Especially because you can control 100% of the water in there as well. Right. Yeah. So there is a, there is a packed down walking path, but harvesting a 52 inch bed i'm gonna climb into that bed from time to time yeah with that i'd like to stop here and take a quick break in a minute we'll be back with jason hertz from box turtle farm if you've been enjoying this episode so far you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer it includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. And we're back with Jason from Box Turtle Farm. So how are you wash and packing then the crops? We have a building that was here when we bought the farm. And I ha really the room is just 15 by 15. That will be next on our list in a couple of years as a new pack shed. But um, I'm triple washing. So in that room... And the cooler is off of that room. So we have an okay. 8 by 12 cooler. It's not taking up the interior space. Yep. And inside that room, we have 300-gallon wash tanks and the washing machine with the spinner baskets. Yep. And all of our tables and crates in there. Okay. So it's, it's cozy. Yeah. But I can put a lot of produce in that room still. Yeah. So are you using bubble washers at all or just tanks? I am not using the bubble washer. Okay. So no, just, just three... 
just tanks. And I know, I know that most people are not triple washing, Mm -hmm. but I know that, I know that my customers, especially the retail customers, the ones that are buying the five ounce bags in the grocery stores. Yeah. A lot of them are seeking that out because they have, they have health problems. Yeah. And they really want something that's clean. And I'm not certain that my restaurants are washing it again either. Yeah. Some may be, some may not be. Um, But I'm, I'm suspecting that a lot of my retail customers that buy it in a five ounce bag are not washing it. Yeah. So you're just selling that as a rinsed product though. You don't say triple washed on the bag. It sells, it says very clearly on the bag to, to wash before eating. Yeah. So I don't advertise it, but I want it to be as clean as possible when it goes out. Yeah, absolutely. And And I know that, so the first tank obviously is just a rinse tank. Mm -hmm. The second tank has sanitizer. Yep. Looking at the water in that sanit in that second tank, if it was me, I would want to wash that product again. I uh-huh. want it to come out of crystal clear water. Yeah, yeah. And the third tank is just really does the trick. <laughs> yeah, it takes yeah. it takes extra time. Yeah, yeah. So it's rinse, sanitize, rinse. Okay, so when you do that, are you using like the, the baskets to push it between it, or how are you fishnets, or how are you moving it from tank to tank? Like a big strainer. Okay. Big handheld strainer. Interesting. So then let's talk about the sales because Columbia is not a huge city. How many, how many people are in Columbia? Yeah. We're actually in Springfield. Sorry. Yes. I'm, I'm not certain. I want to, I want to say there's about 400,000. Okay. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not certain about that, but no, okay. it's not a big market. Okay. But you're, so you're pretty much owning the greens in that market though. Yeah, we really don't have, we used to have more competition. And I think the competition that we had when we started, those several farms have disappeared. I think they've all closed. Mm -hmm. And I think if we didn't own, so we do own that market now. I think if we didn't, we would still have a new farm that would pop up and try and uh, try and address those stores each year. Because I know that they have my managers at those stores are sick of people trying to sell microgreens. <laughs> yeah. And I know that on paper, the salad greens look really easy to grow also. So that was our issue before was that there were a couple established farms that are now gone, but then there were also startups that would usually try and undercut the price also, but they would pop up in season when it was easy and then disappear. Mm -hmm. so we've been working with those stores now since 2012 and we've done we've done other grocery stores at one point in springfield we were dealing with three separate grocery chains and really we've just whittled it down i mean at one point when we were in kansas city too i think when we were in kansas city we probably had 15 or 16 stores between the two cities and once we started to focus in on our best customers and give them what they wanted all the time, we've really cut it down to where we just deal with maybe six regular uh-huh. customers. And it really has simplified everything. Yeah, absolutely. So what does a typical day look like for you on the farm? And obviously there's going to be different like seeding days and like harvest days. Well, Again, since we focused on salad greens, it really simplifies that too. I'm busy yeah, all the time, but I know that I have to harvest. So I, there's certain things that are set in stone, delivering every Tuesday and every Friday. So Monday is a wash pack day, harvest wash pack. Regardless, it takes up the entire day. Tuesday is an easy day because I can deliver. It takes about two hours. And seeding and planting typically takes place on Tuesday also. Mm -hmm. Wednesday, Thursday, harvest, harvest wash pack again, and then deliver on Friday. So really everything revolves around harvest washing and packing happens same days every week. Planting happens on the same day every week. And delivery happens on the same day every week. And then I have some slush time 
after deliveries if there's another project. Mm -hmm. But so much of it is scheduled now. Mm -hmm. And since I'm indoors, weather really isn't dependent. You know, it's not really a factor. Yeah. On a good day, it's actually a rainy day because I might be able to harvest triple since I don't have to get it done first thing in the morning. Yeah. I might be able to, you know, knock out my week's harvest on a rainy day and then move some things around and get something else done. But yeah, it's one of the wonders of high tunnel farming is yeah i can yeah. plan all of it exactly yeah so how many hours a week do you feel like you're working the farm then it depends i i work a lot um probably 60 hours a week but you know i i'm done at five every day um days don't run long if something doesn't get done by five then it just doesn't get done that day. Mm -hmm. So we have we have two kids now. Um, during the winter, I start a little later, so I go till five thirty. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I think I, I still work too many days, but I definitely have a set start and stop time. Mm -hmm. I've reined that in. Mm -hmm. um, and this year has been a little crazy too because. Katie quit her job in 2017. Okay. And she was helping with wash pack and delivery, but she has been on maternity leave for like a year now. Yeah. And so. So you have no employees I, then? I don't. No, I, I have a friend that helps me in the summer. He's a teacher. So okay. for about six weeks in the summer, I have 20 to 30 hours of extra help. Okay. But outside that, and, you know, before last year, Katie would help for 20 hours a week, but with a newborn, that has been impossible. Yeah. So, but you know, it really went fine. Yeah. The last, last year. So I've you're working a lot of hours, but it's, it's all, you get, yeah, it's, it's working. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely working. Yeah. What was the, what would be the couple things that you would do if you wanted to work less hours Are all your irrigation automated? Would you automate other things? I, I do need to automate my irrigation and really we don't, I need water storage because ah. our pump doesn't really put out enough to irrigate the whole farm at once. Mm. But I think that's going to be the, the time saver is going to be a change in harvesting. Okay. Um, yeah. I that gonna, takes a lot of time. Yeah. We, we are definitely with the new houses. We're definitely going to hire some help this year. Because I'm starting to think Katie's not coming back. Just, <laughs> it's been a while now. <laughs> She's still and saying, yeah, I just need a couple more days. <laughs> well, no, our daughter doesn't. You know, before, our first daughter would take these two and three hour naps. Mm -hmm. So Katie could come out and yeah. watch pack. I know all about that. <laughs> yeah, that our, our daughter Edie, our new, new little girl, that only naps for about 30 minutes. Yep. And she doesn't like to be set down. So it makes that impossible. Yep. Yep. Kids but, will um, really throw you through a loop. Yeah. But it, it, the year has not definitely not been impossible. We still go on vacation every year. We try uh -huh. and get off the farm for about eight days. Um, you know, I try and make time for conferences and. Yeah. Yeah. You're able to come to that, uh, the frozen ground in the middle of the summer. So. Yeah. When you get a, when you get an email from, um, Sandy Arnold and Elliot Coleman, you find a way to make it up there. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and it's really, it's one of the benefits of the customers that we have settled on. Mm -hmm. We've really shopped around for customers. And we don't usually meet anyone that's actually eating our salad. But we've really based our marketing on the relationship with our our chefs and our produce buyers, and they completely understand that we're going to take a vacation. Mm. And instead of doing, I'll have someone here. So instead of doing two deliveries that week, I'll do one big one and I'll have that person deliver it for me. But they completely get it. It's just, yeah, we've based our system on being as reliable as possible. And we know we, you know, we know when we're going to go on vacation. So there's really no surprises there. Uh -huh. But I don't think we could 
we couldn't work our lives around 15 grocery stores that didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you've built yourself very high quality product delivered basically to a very select handful of customers, which allows you to probably get a premium price and just to design the life you want. Um, sort of. We don't really get a premium price. We've always tried to be okay. competitive. When we're in Springfield, Missouri, Yeah. price is a big deal here. Yeah. So we've, we've always tried to be competitive with the wholesale market. I mean, not right to the penny. We do expect a little bit of a premium. Yeah. But we're still, we're mostly wholesale, you know, we're wholesaling. Yeah. To those stores. Um, but we keep the quality high and we're regular. So yeah. with, the, with the new tunnels that I built, it's the first time that we've taken a break from actually marketing since 2017. Mm. The first time our stores have been without salad and they knew that that was coming. Yeah. We're back just last week, I went back to delivering and every store we were in, they're saying, wow, you, we've had customers calling and asking. And you know, it seems crazy to me because it's just salad. Yeah. I wouldn't call a store and say, is my salad in yet? But the <laughs> store that we go to, yes. um, they have customers. We had a store delivered in and we walked in the back of the store. They were on the phone with somebody. And, you know, I drop off the produce and they say that person just, they called asking if, if box turtle salad was in yet. Like, that's weird. And I go and I buy a few groceries. It's my last stop. And I'm heading out and they're on the phone again. And I'm like, is that, and I can hear him talking. I said, is that the, is that the same person? No, that was someone else. They asked me to call when their product was in. Wow. And it's just, I'm, I'm so thankful that we have a customer base like that. And it's, it blows my mind because it's still, it's good salad. Yeah. But it's, it's salad. Uh, yeah. But we, we've, we've sort of made ourselves indispensable to those, those grocers now. They're, they're customers have to have it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so absolutely and, and the prices i mean it's there's a couple stores that only carry our salad when we are out is the only time that they'll get something from the distributor from the distributor yeah but the other stores that carry things from the distributor the price is the same so they're getting you know organic girls on the shelf right next to box turtle farm and they're the same price mm-hmm Gotcha. So, so who would you say your mentors have been over your farming journey? You know, I, I haven't really had any set mentors. Okay. And I think it, I think it really slowed down the progress. Mm. Um, now, you know, early on I read everything Elliot Coleman wrote. And when I, when I knew that we were going to go into more high tunnel production, when we built the first high tunnel, I sought out Paul and Sandy Arnold's, their PowerPoint, comp, you know, their, yep. all the material from their conferences is available online. So I studied those before, mm -hmm. years before I met Paul and Sandy, mm -hmm. but they, they were inspirational, but they really weren't mentors. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. all along the way, I've met other farmers and people that, encouraged me and let me know that I was on the right track because mm -hmm. you're not sure when you're out here by yourself mm -hmm. and things really aren't going great in the beginning and there's a lot of doubt there is this right should I keep doing this is this going to pay off mm -hmm. but am I going to make money yeah am I going to make money eventually because we definitely weren't making money <laughs> in the beginning yes uh, took a lot of years to get into the black mm -hmm. but um yeah, we, I never really had, I never had that. And I wish I, I wish I would have worked on more farms first and developed something like that. Mm -hmm. Some type of formal mentorship. Yeah. Yeah. So if there was like a magic reset button as it relates to starting your farm, what systems would you go back and put in place sooner? I wish I would have bought a good tractor in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, like I said in the beginning, I'm, I wasn't sure that it was going to work. And I really should have had more confidence in myself because we moved out here to farm. You know, we moved three hours across the state and bought a farm. But then even once we're out here, there was a lot of doubt to where I didn't really want to invest in really good equipment in the beginning. So we yeah. bought a tractor, but it wasn't a good one. And now I have a nice Kubota tractor with a hydrostatic transmission and a front end loader. Yeah. And I wish I would have bought that in year one and just paid it off. Yeah. What's the model number? It's the L3400. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a popular one. Yeah, it's perfect for a 16-acre property with the amount of ground that I'm working. It can pull the water wheel transplanter that I haven't actually used in quite a while now. (laughs) Uh, But I wish that I would have bought that from the get-go. You know, you could go to – it would have been so much easier with all the construction projects that I had. Mm -hmm. And once I started really getting into high tunnel building, I picked that thing up pretty quick. Yeah. But, man, just moving material around. And I really needed something that would start every time. Mm -hmm. And I wish I would have just bit the bullet and done that from day one. Mm -hmm. And then the high tunnels, too. I started with Caterpillar tunnels. And I... You fought with those. I did. And I, you know, I... I had to fight with engineering them because there wasn't really a great blueprint out there. And I have a, a really good design now that I, that I made myself, but they still can't be vented on a day with mm-hmm. 40 mile an hour winds. And, but I wasn't really willing to spend the money on a high tunnel either. Yeah. So, I mean, we had a lot of Caterpillar tunnels. I had eight and four were 125 feet long and four were 175 feet long. Wow. So it was definitely a big investment, and it's not something that I use now. Mm-hmm. So is someone selling an awful lot of Caterpillar bow- bows? <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. I keep thinking maybe I will use those. I okay, think, so you're hanging someone, on to them still. If someone needed, I would like to keep one. If someone needed them. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would unload those, but yep. I'm kind of too busy to actively seek out a buyer. <laughs> yes, yes. Too, so. Yeah. So you're not doing clamshells. So that's, that saves you a tremendous amount of, yeah, expense there. No, and we did have, early on, we had, a, we had a retail customer. And it's really, it's a store that we still work with the most. It's our biggest, our biggest customer. They wanted us to do clamshells. And they wanted us to do clamshells or to go down on the price. Mm-hmm. And I refused to do clamshells. And I thought <laughs> it was even a ridiculous request for them to, yeah to negotiate price with me because i knew what they were getting from their wholesaler yeah so i gave him a price break for about two weeks i gave him i don't know 25 cents off a bag or something and went back up and i won that but you know there's we use a lot of plastic out here i mean you know, i'm in high tunnels but yeah there's i bought a clamshell back then and i put it on my scale and there's it's 15 times heavier than the bag that I use. Mm-hmm. That's, that's 15 times more plastic. And mm-hmm. the bags I use, I'm heat sealing a really nice, it's a 9 by 12 poly bag. It's 1.2 mil. So they're crisp and clean, and they really have a great presentation. And the whole packaging... If you can look at our website or our Facebook page, you can see our package in yeah, a larger nice. grocery store. Thank you. It gets confused with um, commercial trucked in package. Mm. And we only have about with the, the front logo, the front sticker. And there's a sticker on the back with ingredients and the lot number. We're only at about 12 or 13 cents of package for all mm. of it with the bag and the stickers Yeah, and clamshells. I mean, it would cost me probably $6,000 out of pocket a year if I went to clamshells. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point, if I had a customer absolutely request a clamshell, I would probably drop that customer and move on. Mm. Because we have that kind of demand that I could could just pick up a a restaurant and drop that grocery store. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So let's, we've already kind of covered your marketing. You're selling to the, these uh, five or six customers, selling a retail bag. You're selling to the groceries, sorry, the um, chefs as well. Are you doing any promotion now? We do very little because we don't really have to anymore. Mm -hmm. um, after Katie, when Katie quit her job in 2017, we hired a photographer to come out and take pictures of the farm mm -hmm. and family photos too. If you want yes. a tax deductible family photo session, <laughs> and we we have signed, we use those photos. It was really the first time that I put our faces on anything. Mm -hmm. We have now we have signs in all of our grocery stores with those photos and our logo on there. And we also have, we have a professionally designed logo too. Mm -hmm. um, so we put those signs up and we've, since we've been more reliable on our supply, I haven't really had to do any real marketing in several years now. Mm -hmm. We did have, we did some marketing. We advertised on grocery bags and our grocery stores. Mm -hmm. So our logo would be on there. And we've dropped that. We do next to no Facebook marketing, but we're sold out all the time. Uh -huh. And, you know, we built these two new houses. We're expanding a little bit, but really not much. Um, it's just quality and dependability uh -huh. has kept it going. Uh -huh. Let's talk a little bit about new farmers because you've been around now to see probably you said farmers come and go. What do you think the biggest mistake that beginning farmers make is? Oh, you know, I'm really not tuned in to beginning farmers. I mean, I don't, I don't know any in my area, but mm. I can speak from my experiences that I really, I had no business starting a farm the first year. Okay. I, mean, I, I started with a 12 member CSA, but growing everything for a CSA right off the bat, that was not the best way to get into that. Mm -hmm. And I had a farmer that I had visited. He said, Oh, you want to do that? That's a lot of work. But I was mm -hmm. in my early 20s and I didn't listen. And I wish I would have listened more. You know, you go and visit a farmer to learn something and then you don't listen to him <laughs> because you have your own ideals about how things should work. Mm -hmm. And I wish I wish I just would have taken that to heart and paid attention. And I mean, we eased into it pretty slow, but it was definitely a rocky start. Mm. So would you go back and then just simplify, simplify, simplify those first couple of years? Um, it takes a while to figure out where you're going to go, but I wish I would have spent more time with other farmers so I could see different models versus just honing in on this thing that I thought I wanted to do. I would never want to run a CSA again. I don't know why. I, I guess I wanted to do everything. We were, we were also raising chickens. And we, when we moved here, we bought a flock of sheep and we had some cattle. We pretty much raised everything except for pigs mm. and um, cut all that out. And, yeah. and, and we were doing every, every vegetable too. And now we've gotten down to where we really only grow like five things. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I, I still like the idea of the small farm that has all these different, all these different facets to it, but my life is so much easier now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 And, absolutely. And, and people love what we have. I don't really feel like it hasn't been a compromise to go that route either. Mm-hmm. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? I definitely love my tractor. Okay. Even though I know a lot of people look at this and be like, well, he's really only farming now 16,000 square feet. You could do that with a BCS mm -hmm. or you, you, there's a lot of other options, but man, that thing was down for a few days last week. Um, it got really cold and I plugged up a fuel filter and the battery died. Like, oh, that's always fun. Yeah, in the same week. And that was a rough week. Yeah. Just moving moving stuff around the farm. <laughs> I use that front end loader all the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm I'm happy now that I have 
more smaller tunnels and it makes sense to use that in there too. Mm -hmm. Now, when you work in there, do you take the bucket off or you just, uh, you figured out how to make it work? I don't take the bucket off. It doesn't have a quick attach. Mm. So it's kind of a dance to get in there. There's a certain yeah. rhythm to it, you know, getting in the corner and um, you can't fully get the, you can completely get one end, but yeah. the end that you exit out of, you can't completely, but I still have the small tiller too. And mm -hmm. I could probably make it work without picking up the small tiller. But I can get complete coverage with the two combined. But it's, you know, I've, I've used, I've really abused my body since I've been doing this. Yeah. And any opportunity I have not to do that just seems like it's the obvious choice now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So where's the best place for people to get in touch with you? We do have a website, um, boxturtlefarm.farm, which we haven't updated in quite a while, but it is there and someone can reach us through it. We have a Facebook page and people can find me on Facebook in different groups. I'm around, you know. Lurking. But, uh, lurking, <laughs> yeah, lurking, commenting, <laughs> posting sometimes, but I'm definitely there. But um yeah, as far as updating our own Facebook stuff goes, I found that it was really more farmers commenting on it than customers. So, yeah, I, yeah, I haven't really updated it too much lately. Absolutely. Well, Jason, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's a fascinating conversation. Always interested in hearing how others are doing it, especially when you're like in a place that's not known for, you know. Um, you know, high customer base, you know, you're out in the middle of Missouri. So it's always interesting to hear how you've done it, your journey, just how you've um, persevered and made it work and built that life um, and figured out how to um, make your farm work for you. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Michael. It was my pleasure. And that is a wrap with Jason. Next week, we'll be talking to Mark Baker. Now, I met Mark at Joel Salton's Rogue Food Conference a couple of months ago, and I wanted to bring him on and have him share his story. Now, Mark was a heritage breed pig farmer in Michigan, and the state decided one day that the breed of pigs that he was raising was illegal, which prompted a multi-year legal battle between Mark and the government, which resulted in Mark ending up winning that legal battle. But along the way, the government decided to harass the restaurants that Mark sold to, as well as do several other uncouth things toward Mark and his family. So you definitely want to listen to this podcast. It's a little scary in places. And so it's definitely something that we should be thinking about as our state's food regulations get more and more strict. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer Podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.